Hello, my name is Monica Brown and I teach eighth grade U.S. History and Social Studies at Key Middle School. Today I'm going to take you through a lesson where we're going to look at the antebellum North and South. We will be looking at the characteristics that make up these two very different regions. And as we look at the different characteristics, please keep in mind that we are looking at the ESPN of each region. Remember that ESPN stands for Economic, Social, Political, and Environmental Issues. But before we get started, there are a couple of things that I do want you to have. You will need to have a pen or pencil to take some notes, and you will need to have paper. And of course, if you like to write in your journal, you most certainly can use your journal. So our learning targets today are that we're going to be able to compare places and regions in the United States in terms of physical and human characteristics. You're also going to identify economic differences among the different regions, and we're going to also look at the cause and effect of what made things happen. You know, economic, social, political, and environmental development, well, it often creates widely different, sometimes conflicting, regions within one nation. So here's your question that I want you to consider today as we go through our lesson. Why did the economies of the North and South develop so differently? What were the eco economic and social differences between the two regions? Well, as we go through our lesson, let's start here with our reading. We are going to look for characteristics of the North and South. And you will also notice that in the reading, I have already highlighted some really important facts that I want you to pay attention to. As I read, I would like for you to follow along. The North and South developed differently from each other in the first half of the 1800s. Geography was a principal reason Northerners and Southerners developed different ways of life. All Northern states experienced four distinct seasons from frozen winters to hot and humid summers. The northern states had colder winters and shorter summers than states further south. Different areas in the north had distinct natural features. The jagged New England coastline, it was perfect for harbors. The area was covered with thick forests, and as one traveled south and west into the central plains, the rich soil enabled people to support themselves by farming. Now, the southern states enjoyed mild winters and long, hot summers. Wide coastal plains edged the shorelines. Along the coast, the plains were sprinkled with swamps and marshes. Above the plains lie the Appalachian Mountains. Here, settlers carved farms and orchards out of rolling hills and mountain hollows. Southerners used natural resources such as fish, oysters, and crabs, to make a living. An important feature of the South was its broad rivers. Many of the South's earliest towns were built at the mouth of rivers. In the North, the new inventions of the Industrial Revolution led to the development of textile mills and factories. Increasing numbers of people went to work as wage earners. The North became urban as more people were moving to cities. Between 1840 and 1860, the populations of New York, Philadelphia, and Boston nearly tripled. People lived in unhealthy and unsafe conditions. In dirty, crowded neighborhoods, disease spread rapidly. Although African Americans were free, they were not treated equally to whites. In most states, they could not vote, they could not hold office, they couldn't even serve on juries or attend white churches or schools. The South depended primarily on agriculture. Although a minority of white Southerners owned slaves, much of the economy depended on slave labor to raise cash crops such as cotton. In the South, 
most people lived and worked in rural areas. The majority of whites were small, independent farmers. Most of these small farms did not own slaves. However, the large plantation owners owned large numbers of slaves. The great majority of African Americans at that time were slaves. Some worked as cooks, carpenters, blacksmiths, house servants, or maids, but most of them were field hands. So I want you to take a look here, and I've provided you a graphic organizer of the characteristics of the North and the South. Can you think of some of the characteristics of the North and South that we just read about? One thing that comes to mind immediately as I'm thinking about what the North was like, well, if I think about the economy and how they made their money, there were textile mills. It was more industrial, okay? If I think about one of the characteristics of the South, well, they made their money from cash crops, cotton, slave labor. Even though many of the people in the South were farmers, independent farmers, and did not own slaves, the basics of the economy came from those cash crops that were sold and traded. So I have a piece here that says, show me, don't tell me, North or South. Based on what we just read through, can you tell me if each one of these sentences is about the North or is it about the South? So let's go through this real quick, okay? We've got about seven here. The first one, most people lived in cities. Well, was that the North or was that the South? Number two, the economy was primarily agricultural. Was that the North or the South? Number three, relied on slave labor. North or South? Had natural harbors and thick forests. Number five, most African Americans were slaves. Number six, most white people were farmers. And number seven, many mills and factories. So as we've gone through each one of those, did you determine whether or not it was the North or the South? Well, let's take a look. I provided you the answers here, so let's take a look and see if what you came up with matches up with what the reality is. Most people lived in cities, well, that was the North. The economy was primarily agricultural, that was the South. Relied on slave labor, that was the South. Had natural harbors and thick forests, the North. Most African Americans were slaves, that was the South. Most white people were farmers, the South. And many mills and factories, that was the North. So I have here a Venn diagram, okay? And we're going to continue comparing and contrasting the antebellum North and South. I really want you to understand how different these two regions are. Yeah, we, they were in the same place, but they were two distinct regions. ESPN, remember, economic, social, political, and environmental. All of those played a huge part in creating such different regions. Now, here's a Venn diagram that I actually did with my students at Key Middle School. We decided to look at it, so I kind of divided my class, and I had one side to do the north, and I had the other side of my class to do the south. And then we all came together to look at, you know, I said, give me at least three things that both of them had in common. So you see here on the north, they chose wage earners, rocky soil, harbors that were naturally made, worked at factories, jagged coastlines, long winters, African-Americans not treated equally, short summers, and thick forests. The other side of the class decided to do the south. 
So they came up with slaves, rich soil, the farmers that did not own slaves, plantation owners, the economy dependent on slave labor, short winters, natural resources, cash crops, and warmer climate. I think they did pretty good. And when we came together, I said, just give me at least three that you think of. They came up with three. African Americans were not treated equally, natural resources, and forests. So they thought that those were two things or three things that they had in common. So I think they did pretty good. So now let's look at the ESP causes of the war. We've already talked about the different regions. Now let's look at, as we're going into this civil war, let's discover what the causes were. But before we get started, too deep into that part of the lesson, I want you to make a real life connection. I want you to imagine that you are going to buy a car and you are on a budget. Now, here are your two choices. They are very similar cars. The only difference is where they are manufactured. Which car would you rather buy? The foreign car for $17,500 or the domestic car for $20,000? Remember, you are on a budget. So I'm giving you a picture here. Which one of these would you rather buy? Would you prefer this foreign car on the left? That is $17,500. Or would you prefer to have the domestic car that's made in the United States that costs $20,000? Now, if you're anything like my students here, they immediately said, Ms. Brown, $17,500. I don't care where it's made. I want the car that I can afford, okay? That was immediate. Is that your answer as well? Are you thinking, hey, I'm on a budget. Give me the car that costs the least. I don't care where it's made. Okay, maybe you agree with my students. But now let's take a look at this. Which one would you buy now? Notice that the price of the foreign car has changed. Who would buy the domestic car? Now we have this $17,500 car but guess what? We have added a $6,000 tariff. Now that car is $23,500. What happened to the price of the car? Well, we have a tariff was added. Why was a tariff added? Better yet, what is a tariff? Well, a tariff is a tax on imported goods. So we have this car, even though it was cheaper before. We have added a $6,000 tariff, kind of a fee, because it was made outside of the United States. Sort of like, if you're gonna sell a car here, we're gonna add a tax to it. Sometimes these are also called protective tariffs. A protective tariff is a tax on imported goods designed to protect domestic manufacturers from foreign competition. So definitely everything that we buy just about, shoes, clothing, electronics, okay, they might be made outside of the United States, but we add an extra tax onto those items that are brought into the United States. The whole goal is to protect those companies that are actually here. We just kind of charge an extra fee for that. So I want you to take a look here. Remember, we're going to use our optics to look at this picture. I want you to take a moment and think about what you see here. I'm looking at it as well. Notice on the left, I think I see a house in the background. And I see a guy, he looks like he is really sweating. He has a bag around his neck. And then on the right side, I also see a house that's in the background. But the guy who's in front of it, he doesn't look like he's disappointed. He actually looks like he's happy. 
The guy on the left says, it's too heavy. I can't breathe. And then I see that house that's in the background there. It looks a little tattered, a little torn up. Okay, looks like you could use a little work. The house on the right, it says domestic manufacturers. Okay, looks like those are the people that are here at home. And the guy here, it looks like he's saying, oh, that bag looks mighty heavy, neighbor. I'm sure you can handle it. What do you think the message is here? Well, when I showed this to my students, I think they got what the message was and they picked it up pretty quickly. It looks like the guy on the left, the bag that he's carrying around his neck, it says tariffs, tax, okay? Looks like he might be suffering from having to pay too much tax. It's heavy, it's weighing him down. But the guy on the right is like, ah, you're, you're okay, you can handle it. Notice also that on each person that you have north and south. The guy on the north, he looks like he's okay. But the guy on the south, from the south, he's having to pay taxes. He's having to pay taxes on all of those cash crops that he's using, okay? So they definitely did not like that the things that they were producing in the south, they had to pay extra tax. Well, let's discover a little bit more and understand why. We know that the South opposed tariffs and the North supported tariffs. Now let's look at why. Protective tariffs caused a strong disagreement between the regions of the United States. The North's economy was largely based on manufacturing. And as a result, protective tariffs helped Northern businesses by protecting them from foreign competition. The West also supported protective tariffs. The revenue from tariffs was being used to build transportation systems, particularly railroads, which linked Western cattle and lumber producers with Northeastern markets. The South, on the other hand, had an economy that was primarily agricultural. The tariffs increased the cost of manufactured goods that Southerners bought. Southerners argued that tariffs had a significant negative impact on the South. But in 1816, Congress passed a protective tariff law. However, the tariff rates of 1816 were not high enough to satisfy the Northern business owners. In 1824, Congress raised the tariff rate and placed tariffs on many more items. The South, they weren't happy with this, and they began to protest the increased tariffs. Four years later, while John Quincy Adams was the president, Congress passed a still higher tariff law. So now it's 1828. The high tariff rate caused states without many industries states in the South to become very angry. Their citizens would have to pay higher prices for manufactured goods without any benefits to the states. Most of the opposition to the protective tariff came from the South, which had developed few industries. In the South, the tariff of 1828 was called the Tariff of Abominations. Okay, and an abomination is something that is hated. When Andrew Jackson became president in 1829, he found that the tariff had become an explosive issue. Leaders in the South, particularly South Carolina, were talking openly about defying the laws of the national government. A long lasting conflict between the industrial North and the agricultural South, well, that was just beginning. Now let's look at this whole issue of nullification and states' rights. Take a look at this graphic here. Breaking news. 
Texas refuses to obey national law. It just won't do it. Can you imagine if the state of Texas actually refused to obey a national law? What do you think would happen? More so, is this allowed? Can states get rid of laws that they just don't like? Can you make that decision? Well, differing political viewpoints contribute to misunderstanding and it can even escalate to conflict, even war. So can a state overturn a federal law? Before I go any further, I wanna go through just a few vocabulary words that you are going to hear. So states' rights. States' rights are the belief that states should be able to ignore federal laws. Secede. Secede means to leave or withdraw from the country. Nullify. Nullify means that you refuse to recognize a federal law. So now let's look at the nullification crisis. Frustrated with these increasing tariffs that we just talked about, South Carolina decided to nullify the tariff of 1832. South Carolina avoided the tariff, banned collection of its duties, and threatened to secede from the union if the federal government tried to enforce it. This was known as the nullification crisis. President Andrew Jackson got Congress to pass the force bill, which authorized him to send troops to force South Carolina to pay the tariff. Cooler heads prevailed when the Compromise Tariff of 1833, which was written by Henry Clay, was passed. This compromise helped ease sectional tensions. South Carolina backed down. Andrew Jackson won the showdown between himself and the states. But this issue of states' rights, this will be debated until the Civil War is decided once and for all. Okay, so we have three people that are in this argument of nullification. So this is part of the nullification crisis. We'll start with John C. Calhoun. Okay, John C. Calhoun He's considered to be the Southern champion. He was born in South Carolina, supported the idea that states have the right to nullify federal laws. He believed tariffs had a negative impact on the South. But then we have on the extreme opposite side, we have Daniel Webster. Daniel Webster believed that federal sovereignty power over state sovereignty. He supported high tariffs to protect northern industries. Daniel Webster is considered to be the defender of the union, and he was a representative from Massachusetts. But then we have here in the middle, we have Henry Clay, who's considered to be the great compromiser. Henry Clay developed the American system, a plan which included high tariffs to fund internal improvement. He was responsible for the Compromise Tariff of 1833 that helped postpone the Civil War. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope that you got a lot from today's lesson. We talked about the characteristics of the North and the South. We looked at the ESPN issues that plagued the North and the South. And I hope that you got that each region was extremely different. We also looked at the nullification crisis and just the idea of what it means to nullify. This is just the beginning of what is to come. In our next lesson, we'll talk about the Civil War and we'll look at some of the leaders of the Civil War.